the RTE Rugby Podcast, sponsored by Canterbury. See the new Irish men and women's rugby jerseys at canterbury.com. All right, you're very welcome along to this week's RTE Rugby Podcast. Neil Tracy here with you again. Hugh Cattle's off. We're managing his minutes, I think, after a busy a busy Autumn Nation series. But uh, Donal Lennon and Bernard Jackman still with us as they are every week. What's the deal, guys? You're not... You're we're not more, getting those those player management issues get, or anything like that, are you? We get more sleep than Hugh, so we're able to turn up every week. <laughs> <laughs> That's our secret or mine. Anyway. Uh, Hugh, Hugh, Hugh is getting precious now. He's doing soccer, rugby, ga, horse racing. So uh, you know, I think he must he must be playing hard to get. Yeah, it's like the it's like these interpros, you know, he's so busy over Christmas doing the horse racing as well that he needs to he needs to yeah. get his rest now ahead of those uh, ahead of those big games. But look. We'll plow on. We'll plow on. Plow on without him. And as I said, you've been busy, man. You ran against the head on Monday night, the two E. So because of that, we're actually not even going to touch on the the Autumn Nation series because if people want to find out a little bit more about that, they can go watch it back on the RT player. Because the URC is obviously back this week. Friday night, Connacht against the Ospreys. That's live on RT two and the RT player. We've Munster away to the Bulls on Saturday. The first of the Irish provinces down in South Africa. That's half past five kickoff. Irish time and then Leinster host Ulster at eight o'clock on uh, Saturday evening as well that's going to be live on RT2 and the RT player as well so because we've got so much URC news and not to mention Stephen Larkham which is leaving Munster at the end of this season which is the big talking point we're going to get right into that and we'll skip over the international stuff because if you want to catch up on all that you can go look back on against the head on the RT player but guys we're going to start obviously Stephen Larkham leaving Munster at the at the end of this season it has come out of the blue because it's only September since he actually came out and said how much he was enjoying it there and how he was pretty eager to stay on. But it was confirmed yesterday he's going to go back to Australia at the end of this season when his contract expires. It seems, according to reports in Australia as well, I see the Sydney Morning Herald say he could be announced as the next Brumbies head coach by the by Thursday, so by tomorrow. Um so obviously their head coach is leaving at the end of uh, Dan McKellar. He's leaving at the end of the upcoming Super Rugby season. So that has obviously twisted Larkham's arm to go back. But Donald, I'll start with you. Came a little bit out of the blue, just considering how adamant Larkham was that he wanted to stay and the little bits of of his his print that we'd been seeing on Munster this season. Yeah, look, there was uh, there was talk a couple of months ago down there, uh, down here, that he might be going, but all that passed away. And I think when he came out himself and said, "Look, really enjoying it, looking forward to uh, uh, being with Munster in the longer term," that kind of put that to bed. Uh, I must say, when I uh, I was watching, I think uh, Scotland and Australia on uh, on Amazon, and and Stephen Larkin was on commentary duty, and I was scratching my head wondering why would he want to go over to Edinburgh. Um, in the middle of, 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 of this period. So uh, I'm quite sure he must have spoken to one or two Aussies when he was over in, in Murrayfield that day. Um, look, there's, uh, from Munster's point of view, I think given the turnover of coaches that they've had since 2016, obviously Razzie was there. He was going to stay. All of a sudden he was gone. Jacques Dinarber went with him. As we all know, no, Jacques Dinarber is, is the, the head coach of South Africa. You had the debacle around uh, Felix Jones and Jerry Flannery. They were offered uh, uh, new contracts, but um, not at the same level, or there was obviously issues that they were unhappy with. I think both those guys have since, since they've flown the nest. I mean, Jerry Flannery's had a magnificent period with Harlequins. They won the Premiership last year playing unbelievable rugby. Felix Jones is cemented in the Springbok setup now, having been there for the World Cup. So um, it's a bit of a disaster, to be honest with you. Um, I, I never think it's great when you hear a coach, whether he's an assistant coach or a head coach, you know, he's leaving at the end of the year. You kind of feel as if you're buying time a bit. Uh, plus, to be fair to Larkham, I could understand with young kids, given the issues around COVID over the last year and a half, it must have been a disaster. Uh, uh, he mentioned his daughter specifically. So look, I do take that on board. When you consider the Brumbies' job was coming up, uh, Bernard would know. I mean, anybody who's been in Canberra, the stand uh, in the Brumbies pitch is called the Greg and Larkham stand. So when you're that much ingrained in the culture of a team, then it comes as no surprise to me that he'd go back there. But uh, the timing, as ever, which seems to be a problem in Munster, uh, is an issue. 
Yeah, Bernard. I think that's the thing. It's the timing. Like it was only a couple of months ago there was talk of new contracts. <laughs> and we were all kind of saying it's a bit early to maybe be, you know, to be offering out all these contracts so early in the season. And now we're talking about timing where they're kind of in flux where they've had Stephen Larkham trying to put his print on Munster for the last two and uh, two and a little bit seasons. And, you know, what do they do now between now and the rest of the season? Do they persist with this and try to go after a coach, a new attack coach who can kind of just continue that on? Or, you know, is, is an attack coach coming in next season going to have completely different ideas and how they want to play the game? No, I don't, look, at I think obviously that a new attack coach would have subtle uh, differences in terms of his philosophy, but I still think there's value. I mean, Larkham... Larkham's job is to give Munster more weapons so they can be successful this year. Um, you know, I, I didn't think this was stage one of his development. I, I was hoping that this was was the end point, really. And, and we saw quite quickly the improvements and the, the style that he wanted to play with. So Munster could, you know, try and beat teams in a different way than just putting... Uh, uh, getting them into an arm wrestle, which they're, which they're incredibly good at. So um, I think there's a lot of time left in the season. He has a job to do to, to try and bring Silverware back to Munster. And the next attack coach can come in and have a look at where it's going. And, and either that fits in around their philosophy or they just, just try and make subtle differences to, to make it better. So but I, just as, as a coaching point of view, in terms of family reasons, I, I can totally get that. I mean, um, you know, we had five years in France uh, there was an opportunity to go to Stade Francais, which would have been a, an incredible opportunity for, for me to work with international players, etc. But we made our mind up for the kids that um, we wanted them to be Irish. We wanted them to be educated in Ireland and have some stability. And that was only France, um, you know, which is much closer. So um, I can understand that. It's a long way to, back to Australia. Plus, those jobs in Australian rugby, like Irish rugby, um, the type of job that he would want uh, don't come up very often. So... You know, probably the fact that Dan McKellar is going to the Wallabies full time, um, you know, Brumbies is his, his home franchise, an opportunity to go home. Um, it, you know, it, 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 it makes sense to go home now rather than sign for another year and then there'll be nothing in Australia. And suddenly you're blocked for, for three or four years. So um, it's it's totally un- understandable uh, that, that he's, he's doing this. I suppose the question mark now is what Munster do. You know, yeah. um, Johan is still hasn't signed. There's been rumours in the last week or two that that maybe isn't um, as clear cut as as we all had a, had a, uh, thought or was led to believe. So maybe Munster are looking at a, a complete rebuild in terms of their coaching staff. But in terms of Larkham, I think the guy, and I'm biased on this because I, I, I know him, the guy they should look to try and get home is Mike Prendergast. Um, the job he's done in France, he is recognised in France um, as probably the best attack coach. And, uh, you know, he's done that. He's, he's served his time. He knows Munster rugby, obviously. He's obviously coaching in young Munster, played there, played for Munster. And he's gone to France to, to two, two difficult jobs, Grenoble and Oyana, where you're fighting to stay up. And then, obviously, now he, you know, he's, he's also experienced work, working with top quality internationals like Gail Fiku, Vakatara, Finn Russell, uh, et cetera, um, at Racing Metro. And when, he has had, when he's had the cattle, he's shown what he can do. So, I know Noah McNamara has been linked to it. Obviously, you know that would be a, he's, he's from Clare originally. Um, he's getting experience in, in the Sharks. But if you want someone who's been at the top level, uh, which a top fourteen is now for for nine ten years, I, I, I think Prendy needs to be um, somewhat a monster. Put serious thought into. Donald, would you go along with that as Mike Prendergast, a man monster should should, should should be right up at the top of the list? Well, he ha- he has to be in the equation, uh, as Bernard said. He's he's served his apprenticeship in in difficult environments, and uh, you know when you go into a place like Racine, when you look at the quality of players, Vakatawa, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 Kurtley Beale has been there. Obviously, Simon Zebo was there. You had uh, Ima from Argentina. A whole mix of cultures, uh, and. It's quite telling. I mean, the, the the vibe you get out of there, they, they seem to be very comfortable with Prendergast. He seems to be very well rated there. So, look, it's a no-brainer that he has to come into the equation. Uh, and I do think time is coming where we do have all these Irish coaches who are serving their time abroad, that they have to be brought into the equation. I mean, it's, it's a, a sad indictment of the uh, situation here that at Munster at the moment with Van Graham, Graham Rowntree, Graham Larkin, there is no sort of homegrown Irish fella in there. And uh, look, the DNA of all the provinces is slightly different. And having someone who understands that, I think, is important. But uh, 
more often, I mean, you've got to give the guy who merits it on the basis of what he has done. And Prendergast's track record to me is is outstanding. Uh, it's a question, again, a bit like Larkham when the job came up. And, and to be fair to him, uh, I think Bernard is right. Uh, you know, you only have so many opportunities in Australian rugby because they've only got their, well, four or five, they, depending on whether the Western Force are involved or not. Uh, limited opportunity. Uh, I suppose the issue with Larkham is going back to a job that he had before. Now, to be fair, he was head coach of the Brumbies a number of years ago. He did leave that job to get involved with the Australian national team. So therefore, uh, I don't think that's an issue then when, in terms of him going back into the provincial setup. But um, yeah, look, there's uh, Noel McNamara is, a, is another name that I have heard. And uh, he's a guy very impressed with him when he was with the Irish 20s. Uh, again, I admire people who... Uh, coaching is a very difficult role. And, and, and as Bernard said, bringing up a young family away from home you are asking a lot. You're sacrificing a lot. And that's why I admire the guys who don't take the easy option and stay in Ireland. As Prendergast has done that. We know Mark McCall years ago has done that. Noel McNamara spent a stint down in New Zealand. He's now in South Africa. So you're experiencing different cultures, uh, different approaches, uh, different ways of playing the game. So... Um, I've no doubt uh, like they're doing that with a view to come back to be involved uh, in Ireland some stage down the road. And uh, you've got to grasp the opportunities when they do arise. Uh, so from that perspective, I'm, I'm quite sure uh, Mike Prendergast will be well in the mix. It's a question of, is the time right for him? Uh, does he want to leave Racing? Uh, and what is the setup? With the, the one concern I would have is... Do we know for uh, for certain that Van Gran is going to be the head coach? If he's going to be gone in four, six months' time, well, then a new head coach who comes in might have his own ideas. He could well be a back himself and have his own ideas on how you're playing. So, I mean, you do have that degree of uncertainty at the moment. So I think what they need to do now, before almost before you appoint an assistant coach, is clarify what's happening with the head coach. So, therefore, they need to say, look, Van Gran is staying. Or he's going. Uh, so, I mean, that to me, I think, is a key element on this process now. Because the last thing you want is somebody like Mike Prendergast or Noel McNamara appointed. And then there's a turnover in the head coach seven or eight months down the road. That would be a disaster. Yeah, Bernard, is that the kind of knock-on that this has the potential to kind of destabilise everything a little bit? Yeah, no, I agree with Donald. The, 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 the first thing to do is, is sort out who the head coach. And if that's Johan... Um, obviously that will that will be decided probably probably in the next couple of months, um, and then if it's not, you're obviously going to have to go through that process. And 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 totally, the head coach should either um appoint his his attack coach or maybe as as Don said, he is he is that's he has that skill set himself. But look, I, I, look at it's still very early. I mean, it's not it's it's the end of November. Um, I would say a lot of head coaches are going to be start looking in in January February, um. So Munster don't have to rush into this now. If 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 the negotiations with Johan were were, were stalled for whatever reason, um, but that, that's going to be the the key point. I mean, I don't think Munster branch or the RFU should should talk to or, or, or certainly appoint a, a backs coach without without knowing who the head coach is. And Munster now need to to get some stability for the next two or three years and try and have a, a stable coaching staff. Yeah, and look, I I imagine like while. They might want to go out and absolutely headhunt who they believe is the right candidate. They're not going to have a shortage of CVs landing on the doorstep because if you look at the, the profile of the squad, lots of good young players in there. They're constantly maybe just below the top tier of Europe, but they, they, you know, they're in that bracket where they're competing at the, the latter stages of, of big competitions every year. So don't like, you know, it's not as if they're going to have to go out trying to find someone like there's going to be good candidates making themselves available, you'd imagine. Yeah, look, it's a huge job, as you say. I mean, we're probably overcritical down here. Munster regularly are in the semi-final or final of the, the Pro 14, as it was, the URC now, and new format there. Uh, you know, they've been making knockout rugby in Europe for a long, long time. There's a lot of coaches involved with clubs who don't even get to play in Europe, not a mind get to the knockout phase. So um, it is an attractive job. Uh, I think there is a lot of quality young players coming through in Munster. Um, you know, we've seen... Uh, the likes of Joey Cabri, Ben Healy, Jack Crowley all coming through. So there's, 
you know, there, there, there's a bit of excitement now about what could happen in the future. Um, uh, Damien Dialanda, his contract is up at the end of the year, I think. So it'll be interesting to see what's happening there. Uh, surely any attack coach uh, would be thrilled to have a player of his calibre on board. And, uh, you know, Zebo is back in the mix. You have Conway playing out of his skin. Keith Earl still playing well. Calvin Nash had come in recently and was doing really well. Shane Daly has been in the Irish squad. So there's an awful lot of, of quality material there. Um, but uh, I, as I said, look, I, I mean, it's funny. Um, because of COVID, you don't have the same interaction with people. You don't get to, to see players as often or people in the management group. So um, uh, there's very little sort of, uh, normally you get a vibe on these things and how they're going, but very little talk coming out of the Munster camp at the moment. Um, but I, I, you know, there was at one stage there was mixed feelings about Van Graan. Uh, were they making progress under him? Uh, was he stifling the other coaches? Why did Felix Jones and Jerry Flannery leave when they did? Uh, two guys who were immersed in in, in Munster rugby, if you like. Um, so you know, all that I think has to be clarified. Um, it's just there's a, there's there is a really good squad coming together in Munster, and you know, like I spoke about the backs there up front, you have. You know, the, the, the Gavin Coombs, there's Tom O'Hearns, uh, uh, John Hadnett, um, so many quality young players, Josh Witcherly. Um, like, there is so much quality there, I think, to be an attractive proposition for anyone to take on. And uh, also, I think, hopefully, once this pandemic, once we resolve all that and you're back to 26,000 screaming people inside in Thoman Park, there's very few... Uh, better grounds around the rugby world that people will want to get involved in. So, um, yeah, look, it's it's attractive, uh, but we just have to wait and see. It's, the problem is this thing could be kind of spread out now for months to come, speculation, uh, all, as I say, for the obvious reasons, the head coach has to be sorted out first, but that's not going to happen overnight. But I think it now becomes more important that you have clarity in that role by the end of January at the very latest um, before you go addressing the uh, position with regard to attack. And given that Stephen Larkham is going to be there anyway until June, there isn't sort of massive pressure to fill the road uh, or to fill the role in the, in the short-term period. Well, just the last thing, just the last thing on this, Neil. Um, like, forget about the applicants. You, they'll get 120 emails uh, CVs. In, will, you, will, yours, will yours be one <laughs> of the burners? <laughs> it certainly won't. Um, <laughs> you see, I need to, you, you, have to ask, you have to ask those things just on the off chance in four months' time, Bernard Jackman. The point. No, 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 but certainly not. Um, but the, the person, the, 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 the gold in this is the headhunting. You know, the, the person who Munster need is under contract somewhere and maybe under contract for a couple of years. But, you know, it's about identifying that person. And generally, if Munster ring a coach who's under contract, um, they'll have that call, they'll have that discussion because as Nolan said, it's a very attractive it's a very attractive job, but I wouldn't worry about all the applicants, uh, they're all fellas out of work, it's the guys in work um, and in, in very good jobs who have good reputations, they're the type of people that Munster w- will be looking at. Yeah, and to be fair just on that point, uh, I think Munster haven't been found wanting in going after some of the best people like yeah. money hasn't been an issue you know, when you attract somebody like Erasmus uh, up from the Southern Hemisphere. He's able to bring Nina Arbor with him. So therefore he got the support to build the team that he wanted around him. Likewise, um, you know, when he went, uh, you know, to be able to attract Stephen Larkin from Australia, Graham Rowntree is a fantastic reputation, um, both in England, was involved with Georgia in the World Cup, there's several clubs in the Premiership. So they haven't been found wanting in terms of chasing the right people. Um, so therefore, I, I, I think um, I'd have no doubt the professional board will break iron to make sure they get the man they want. Yeah, certainly. And Donal, you mentioned like some of the, the young players available for Munster. <clears throat> to, to focus, to shift back towards what's happening on the pitch now, a, a lot of those young players are going to be playing this weekend against the Bulls. We're going to find out in a lot of ways, what they're made of this weekend at 1,350 metres above sea level at Loftus Versfeld, where the Bulls haven't been beaten in three years. Yeah, well, look, there's a lot of fellas went to Loftus Versfeld and didn't come out of it very well and went on to have very good careers. So uh, I wouldn't be judging the young fellas solely on what happens over the weekend. But uh, I tell you, it's going to be a brilliant experience for those young guys. Uh, I know some of the... Um, 
uh, a lot of the Irish players, the Munster players who were involved with Ireland, they're being flown out, I think, next weekend. So they'll be involved in the second leg of the tour against uh, the Lions in Johannesburg. But Loftus Versfeld, uh, I'm not quite sure what the position is, is in South Africa with regard to supporters in the grounds at the moment. Um, I believe but, there are. Uh, I believe there are some supporters going to be in. I'm not sure. I'm not sure is it going, uh, how many. Uh, they definitely right. will have some supporters in the stadium. It, it certainly won't be like when the Lions are playing there in the summer, anyway, on a completely empty ground. Um, I yeah. know Yoan yesterday, for example, we had a press conference with him yesterday. He was kind of saying that, you know, it's masks being worn everywhere, but it's completely different to what it would have been like during the during the summer. It's you know, a lot of those restrictions have since been lifted. Yeah, well, look, that'll be interesting. I think uh, it won't do Munster any harm in a couple of weeks' time to spend two weeks training at altitude uh, is going to be a plus. Uh, but the experience they're getting, I'm not quite sure what the temperature is, but I'm uh, are down there at the moment. But they must be in the high 20s at least. Playing at altitude is totally different to what a lot of these young players would ever have experienced. Loftus, even half full, is a kind of a mad place. It's a kind of a... It's a, a a much bigger version of Thoman Park, but the fans there can be pretty. Uh, Bull supporters are fairly, uh, uh, they, they, they get behind their team. I mean, uh, Burnham will remember, he was part of an Irish squad. We, we, we play there in a, a famous Battle of Pretoria, 1998. It was one of the dirtiest matches I've ever been involved in. Uh, I never saw so much blood in a dressing room in all my life, and that was only half time. Um, but uh, if you had that game, I remember 2009, the famous second test, the Lions. Uh, again, one of the most physical international tests I've seen since uh, uh, since rugby went professional. And that is the type of, of arena that you're in. I'll always remember that Lions tour uh, in the middle of the second half. Uh, Ruan Pinar was obviously, he was out half for South Africa that day. We, we come to know him as a scrum half. He was the place kicker, wasn't kicking well. Uh, I was doing commentary on, on RT radio at the time, but right behind me was the box uh, where the South African coaching team were in there. And Marnie Stain was on the bench. Marnie Stain would be diehard Blue, uh, blue Bulls. And, and still the is. He's just, there, still there now. He, he, he's back there now. Yeah. But all the, all the South African fans, well, they were all obviously uh, Blue Bulls fans in the growth. They turned their back on the pitch. They just pointed to the, uh, the, the coach's box and they started demanding Marnie Stain, calling out his name. Within five minutes, he's on the field and he ends up getting the uh, the winning penalty to win the series, which, ironically, he did only a couple of months ago, 12 years later. But that is the type of arena that Loftus is. So uh, it's going to be a huge test for these young players. Um, the only thing I would say, that the Bulls, I think, they haven't played a game for a long time. Uh, and obviously, a lot of the, the, the Munster players, some of them would have been involved playing AIL, Others involved in the name match because there's been this five week window, uh, but they've had no games with URC shutting down for the November series. Uh, you know, it may take teams a while just to get back up to the pace of the game, but I tell you, having to play in 28 degrees and uh, 6,000 feet above sea level is going to put enough pressure on the monster fellas before, the, before they even start. And it's like it's a big weekend for Johan van Graan as well. Going back to you know his home city Pretoria, the Bulls, where he's absolutely ingrained. Like his father was involved with the club for thirty five years. He's a former CEO of the of the Blue Bulls. He grew up as a ball boy at Loftus Versfeld, and he spoke brilliantly yesterday about you know some of the memories he has down the years there as well. So like that's a big it's a big weekend for him as well. And I'm I'm sure the squad are going to want to kind of put something out there for him at the weekend, Birch. Yeah, it's a massive. I, I can't wait to see how the Irish team, well, all the European, the Northern Hemisphere teams adapt to to playing in, in South Africa. Um, and, you know, this is going to be the real litmus test. The, the South Africans found form the last two rounds of, of the URC, having obviously struggled at the start. But this is where they need to make hay. And if Munster can go down to the Bulls and, and, and get a win with all the, the conditions against the minus internationals, you know, at... Um, uh, with, with altitude um, issues or playing at altitude, it, that's going to be a real boost for for the for the European teams. And I think, um, yeah, the fact that Bulls haven't played for a while as well, and it, it's going to be really interesting to see without fans. Um, it, this could be a massive couple of weeks now for for the overall competition in terms of the competitiveness. Because if if they can be strong at home, it's gonna it's gonna make the whole competition much better. 
very quickly. I think, uh, I, I, sorry, Neil, I think, Birch, it's, it's great that it's actually happening, that they now are getting to play home games. Yeah. I mean, the suggestion only a couple of weeks ago was that they would be playing their home games in northern Italy. Um, and look, we saw in terms of the, the November internationals, there's no question the fact that uh, the likes of New Zealand, Argentina, Australia, they'd spent so much time in a bubble, being away from home. It took its toll in the end. So it has to have an impact on those South African players as well. Uh, so by virtue of the fact that they can now uh, play, sleep in their own beds, they can play in familiar surroundings. The fact that I'd say South African fans have been scratching their heads for a while when they saw their sort of famed provincial sides going up to the north and, and getting beaten by all and sundry. They're wondering what's going on. So, um, you know, at least there's a bit of an equalisation now over the next few weeks. Our teams have to go down there. Uh, I think uh, you're going to see the table changing a lot between now and next February. Uh, and that's good for the competition. I mean, this is why the South African teams were brought in in the first place. Add something different. Add a bit of spice. Um, hopefully, in another year or so, fans will be able to travel down. I mean, uh, given that the, you know, the likes of Munster, all our provinces would probably play two games at a time. What a better place to spend 10 or 12 days uh, at a beautiful time of the year, December, January. So I think this uh, is only the start. Uh, but I do think it's important, as Bert says, that the quality of the game and the South African teams now stand up and make life difficult for our teams. Very quickly, before we move on to other games this week, uh, and it's something Johan van Graan was asked yesterday, what's Ben Healy's range at altitude? Inside, oh his own, inside, inside his own 22? Well, well, as I said, you know, we were talking earlier on a couple of months ago about uh, he was standing, I think, it was nearly on the Munster 10-metre line in yeah. his own half. And, yeah. and he, he said it to Peter O'Man, he looked, I think it'd have a pop. And you could see <laughs> Peter, what are you on, you know? So, uh, I, 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 again, I go back to that series, 2009, in Loftus. I always remember Ronan O'Gara, Stephen Jones, I think, they were practicing their place kicking in the warm up of that second test. So they were kind of normally, you know, play, you, you, you do your thing in their own half of the field. But they were sort of kicking from their 10 meter line towards the, the goalpost. And Fran Stain, next thing they looked around, Fran Stain was standing next to him on the, on the 10 meter line in the, in the Lions house. So he was 60, 70 meters from the post. And they're looking at him and he's kicking towards the other sticks. And they, they kind of stopped. And I tell you, he was over the dead ball line every time. So that gives you an indication. Now, we know he's a prodigious, prodigiously long kicker. But, uh, yeah, I doubt to see where uh, Healy's going to attempt his shots from. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting. Well, look, as well as that Leinster and Ulster, that's the, the big Interpro of the weekend. That's Saturday night, 8 o'clock, live on RT2 and the RT player as well. So... If you're looking at the next 10 games, pretty much for most teams, the next 10 weeks, it's 10 matches and you're talking European, you're talking Interpro games as well. Specifically for Ulster, uh, Bernard, they're playing Northampton Saints twice, they're playing Claremont twice, they're playing Leinster twice and they're playing Munster and Connacht. That's eight of their next 10 matches. Like, this is this is the season for, for, for a lot of teams in the league, really, isn't it? This 10-week block leading up to the Six Nations. Yeah, and, and Ulster going into it on a massive downer after that heavy defeat to, to Connacht where they were completely outplayed. And, um, you know, I think obviously generally players and coaches look forward to it, those little mini breaks that, that they sometimes get in the season. And, and obviously they're coming off the back of one. But when you play as poorly as, as Ulster did in the Viva that night, you know, you just want to play the next week. So it's going to be a, a long time for them. And then obviously having to come to the RDS, um, it's, and obviously, as you said, the fixture list they have, it's not going to get any easier. So it's going to be really, this is a big year for Dan and it's a big year for Ulster really. Uh, um, and I don't know, I, th I think, I know they were flying in terms of the results and the bonus point wins, but there was doubts around their level of performance and that got exposed against, uh, against Connacht. And, you know, if they, if they're to be, to not get a win, they need to get a win quickly to, to readjust the, the table. Um I don't see them getting in the RDS. Uh, and, and I wonder about their front five. I know O'Toole's coming through. Um, you, you've got Herring. Um, but I just don't know. Henderson's now out. I just don't know. Uh, Marcel's going to come in. I think their back row are going to be good. Um, they've got a good back line. But I'm just worries about their 
about their ability of front five when they come up against the top six teams in Europe or the top six teams in the in the URC, whether they have that real edge about them. Um, and unless you have that, doesn't matter how good your backline is. So um, Dan's going to find out a lot about those lads in the next uh, five or six weeks. Well, it's something. It's something that it seems they are trying to address as well. Like because I was on, uh, I was on yesterday's call with Dan McFarland, and I don't know. Did you see the reports this week that they'd been in for Stephen Kitchoff, the Springboks loose head, as well as Dwayne Vermeulen, and apparently they'd missed out on Kitchoff. And you know, Dan McFarland, he, he kind of wouldn't. He was fairly coy on it when he was asked about it. You'd you'd be inclined to think there was some substance to to that link, and you know that potentially they missed out on him as well, but. It was funny as well. He was obviously asked, how do you beat, how do you beat Leinster? Is the, you know, the obvious question. And in fairness to him, he did have a good response. He said, don't ask the All Blacks, <laughs> which I think was, <laughs> made a lot of sense. But if you look at, if you look at the teams they're likely to have out this weekend, Donal, like Leinster are going to be fairly decimated with players. Uh, oh yeah. Ulster are going to have a lot of their internationals available, whether or not they choose to play them or rest them further down the line, yeah. aside from Ian Henderson. But you look at who Leinster are missing. Sexton, Conan, James Ryan, Gibson Park. Yeah. And pretty much all of those players who started the three games over the last few weeks mm. are going to be ruled out as well. But that's uh, it, it, it makes the challenge harder in a way for Ulster because uh, Leinster, you're right, none of those Irish players will be playing for Leinster. And Leinster will have been preparing a team, I would imagine, for the last two weeks. All the guys who've been involved in Leinster camp, uh, I would say... Stuart Lancaster and Leo just said, let's forget about the fellas who've been in Ireland camp. They need a week off. They have bigger fish to fry in terms of the uh, Europe, as you said, is only around the corner. Uh, and they have so much quality within their group anyway. A lot of those guys wouldn't have played a whole load of games. So they'd be jumping out of their skin for uh, a match. And we've seen numerous times, probably with the exception of the Dragons game away this year, normally all those Leinster fellas, when they're given the opportunity to play when the big boys are away, they perform. But um, like Bernard is right, the Achilles heel that uh, Ulster have had for a long, long time is their front five. Uh, they've, they've tried to address it. Like Jack McGrath was brought in there. Unfortunately, Jack has been injured for a long time. He's been a huge loss to them. Uh, Marty Moore was brought in. Uh, Carter, the Australian second row. But Henderson, for me... He's the sort of, he's the local boy. He's the fulcrum of that pack. He's the captain of the team. He's a lion. He's a double lion. Um, him getting injured is a disaster, I think, for Ulster. The timing couldn't be worse, um, given the, the fixture schedule. I didn't realise it was as heavy as uh, it was until you actually specified it there. But Henderson's injury could not have come at a worse time. Um and, and Ulster have flattered to deceive. They've been very good against weaker teams, but the manner with which kind of put them away, like that can't have sat easy with, with them. And you're, you're sort of harboring that now for the last five weeks. Um, and, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of pressure on them going into the RDS, which seems a bit strange given that they haven't played for so long. But, uh, you know, I, I, I can just see... Like uh, McFarland, there, there was a number of Ulster players in that Ireland squad who didn't get a lot of game time, but wouldn't have been involved in terms of their preparation. So in many ways, even though Leinster will be short a load of players, their preparation will be better because they have that core group that they're going to play. They've been together now for the past two or three weeks with this game solely in mind. Yeah, and even first, like off, completely off the top of the head, when you take out all those lads who've been playing for Ireland for the last few weeks, you're still talking about there's players in there in with Leinster like Dan Levy. Will Connors is going to be back this week or next week as well. You're going to have Luke McGrath who's going to be available. The two Burns are probably going to be available for, for Leinster as well this weekend. Like, there's still a stacked amount of talent across that Leinster squad that's going to be available for them this week. Yeah, and that's, the, that's been the secret of Leinster is being able to... Uh, win without their internationals. They're well used to this. This isn't rare for them and they'll have been prepping that group. Obviously, maybe a couple of lads who didn't play a huge amount will come back in. Luke McGrath, obviously, last week was with Ireland but didn't didn't play. But they're very comfortable in, in what they do um, and they don't seem to lose any of that cohesion even you know coming out of November internationals or, or Six Nations. And and the depth is the depth is off the scales. I mean, their third choice team would, would probably do, go well in this competition, you know, um, it's certainly been uh, the least mid-table in it. So 
that's the that's the challenge. The RDS. I, I was looking for tickets for someone yesterday. Um, I think it's very close to being sold out. Be a great atmosphere. And yeah, and and normally Leinster don't disappoint. Uh, they they'll get up for this these inter pros um, and bring it to another level. So it's going to be a real test for for Ulster. And I I, I worry for Ulster. I worry if they don't get some positive results over the next couple of weeks. You know, um, where whether they'll be able to rebound. Yeah, it's going to be tough in 2013, obviously, since their last win at the RDS. Um, one positive point for Ulster this week, John Cooney is back and he's available for selection. Uh, would have been available in the last couple of weeks had it not been for the break. But it's funny, between the two injuries and the way they fell that he's had, Bernard, uh, the, the neck injury at the, the tail end of last season, then a summer break, and then he does his hamstring on the opening night of the season this season. So he's played one game in the space of seven months which is like, it's a huge layoff when you actually add the two of them up together combined with the summer break. Yeah, it is, but he's a top, top end player. And um, I wouldn't expect him to take long to, to get back. And particularly, I'm sure he's been watching uh, Doak um, with interest. He, he'll, it's a big test for him actually, because he hasn't really, he's struggled to find his best form when he's had to compete uh, hard for a position. And, and there's a, there's a feeling that, you know he's either number one or or he's not um he's not he's not he's not able to get to that level so uh, this is a chance for him to dispel that myth and 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 get in prove he's still number one and to be honest if you look at a lot of the really good things that have happened to Ulster over the last four or five years he's been at the the core of it so I, I think he is a key man for them with Vermeulen obviously to come back in after after this week when he plays for the Barbas um that could be the, th- those two guys could be the kind of boost um, that Ulster need, particularly now, as, as Don said, with Henderson out for a few weeks. I'm sensing, in terms of a verdict, I'm sensing a prediction for, for two Leinster wins here, guys, is it? Yeah, for me anyway. Yeah, I would say so, yeah. yeah. Look, obviously, you like to see what teams people are putting out, but still, I think, um, yeah, look, Leinster, the RDS, they don't lose there too often, and uh, I think those guys that they've had who've been sitting on the fence for the past four or five weeks will be chomping at the bit for their chance. Speaking of four or five week layoff as well, Connacht will be dying to get back out as well, having you know ended a poor run at the tail end of uh, of the five week block last time around with that great win against Ulster, and they've started this week off brilliantly with Jack Carty signing a three year deal until twenty twenty five. It was very interesting listening to him speak yesterday because he said. 12 months ago when the contract discussions were coming up, he he did have to have a, a real long think about where his future lays, that, you know, he was getting to that age. He was 28 at the time. He's thinking ahead, what's his Ireland situation? Like, what are his future plans? And he said there was a bit of a decision to be made, whereas this time round, it was a very quick process. He wasn't looking to see what else was on the table. He, he wanted a new deal at Connacht and he wanted a long one if possible. And Bernard, does it, does it make a big statement for Connacht to lock him in for three years because they're not a province that are handing out three-year contracts that often. Yeah, I think it's huge. I think it's a huge boost for Connacht. Um, it shows uh, that you know one of their main men believe in the project, believe in where Connacht... Jack would have options. The market for for tens is um, is off the scales, and even just look at the the, the repercussions of. Of McGinty going to Bristol and then George Ford going to uh, going to Sale Sharks. That's just in a Premiership alone. Uh, I know there's four top fourteen clubs looking for uh, a proven ten for for next year. So Carty would have been highly sought after, and the fact that he's committed himself to Connacht, um, I think, is a huge boost. And he's he's really matured. I mean, he's he's a key driver in their leadership group. He's doing it on the field, and uh, yeah, I think it's a great bit of business by by Willie Rand and, and Andy Friend. Yeah, and Donald, I, I think does it does it do a huge amount for Connacht as well in terms of player recruitment and more contract renewals that you know if Andy Friend or or Willie Ran or or Tim Allnott are speaking to players, they can kind of say, Well, look, Jack Carty, the the beating heart of this team, the out half, he is locked in here for three years. He's not going anywhere. We're building this team around him and we want you to be part of it. Yeah, it's a, it sends a very positive message. Uh, I think it's also looked great. Uh, Jack Carthy at, what is he, 28, 29, he now has stability for the next three years. The fact that, uh, and, and bear in mind, Andy Friend, um, he, had, he left Jack Carthy out of the side for long periods last year. Conor Fitzgerald, a young lad, uh, had, had taken over his place. So uh, to be fair to Carthy, he had to knuckle down. 
He obviously had disappointments after the World Cup. He'd been left out of the Irish squad. But he's responded now in the most positive manner possible. And when you see a guy who, uh, who sort of knuckles down, gets himself back to where he needs to be, then gets involved, uh, ended up taking over the captaincy of the team, uh, I think it's a huge statement. But look, um, I think, you know, we're all big fans of Andy Friend, certainly on this podcast. Uh, you know, but I, I think the stability that you have when you have an experience, number 10, look at rugby at all levels, be it international level, be it uh, teams competing for uh, premierships, top 14s, Heineken Cups. You need a quality player in the 10 shirt. I think the fact that Carty has bounced back from the disappointments of last season, he's playing consistency well. I think the trust, and this is the most important thing, I think uh, a number 10 needs to know that he has the backing of his management group, whereas he may not have felt he had that last season. Now he knows, particularly because he's been elevated to the captaincy role, that he has that. And that enables him to drive on with more confidence, bring people with him, um, like Connacht have look at you know what's happening inside a car. You have Marmy and then Keelan Blade both sort of vying, pulling their hair out, dying to get that number nine jersey. That's the level of competition that you need. They have multiple options in midfield, so uh, they have a very good squad. Uh, it is difficult, of course, when you're going up against the uh, the Leinsters of this world when you're involved in the top echelons in 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 the Heineken Cup as they are this year, but. Um, they have a very good squad and there's a lot of positive things happening down in Galway. Uh, you know, if they could get to the stage where that redeveloped redevelopment of the, the sports ground, I think will bring them to another level. So I think, you know, Connacht deserve a huge amount of credit for the consistency. Um, you know, they, they've lacked consistency from game to game, but they've had a consistent ambition to be at the top echelons of the game and improve their standards. And I think they've been doing that uh, certainly since Pat Lamb has been there and a friend following him. Uh, you know, you talk about consistency in terms of your, your coaching group. Like Andy Friend also signing up for another period is huge as far as, as Connacht is concerned. And Berners, if we were to, to look back at the way Ireland have played over the last few weeks, does Jack Carty look like a player that could thrive in that environment? Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, look, the main thing for Jack is to be in a good place um, himself in terms of form and being consistent. And I think he would accept that some of Connacht's inconsistency probably maybe lay, um, uh, you know, with his with his inability to go week to week. So I think that he's trying to fix that. He looks like he he certainly is on the right track um, in that regards. And without a doubt, look at Joey, obviously has had a, a positive um, November and that's that's probably sealed his position as as number two. Harry Byrne looked bright, you know, coming off the bench, had a few hours, but was trying to make things happen. Um, and obviously Faz is, is looking to find out a little bit more about him. But I would say if the World Cup was in January, um, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if Jack Carty was was in there as the third the third ten. So what he needs to do is keep keep playing the way he's playing. Um, and obviously the problem for Harry's going to be how much game time he gets for Leinster. So I, I certainly wouldn't write Jack Carty off um, uh, at all. I think he, he could be um, a really good player for Ireland. And he has the skill set to, to do what, what, what all the tens are, are, are doing um, or, or what, what my cat wants us to do. But I think the more Ireland get comfortable doing that, it'll be easy for any 10 to come in. But what you have with Carty is obviously that kicking game, those attacking kicks in particular, which he's, he's probably as good as anyone at. Yeah, and we've Connacht Leinster next week as well, so we're probably going to get to see Jack Carty going up against one of the Burns. That uh, that'll make interesting viewing. Um, before we finish up, guys, obviously there was there was sad news this week in Irish rugby and uh, for Connacht rugby as well, Donald, with the the passing of Ray McLaughlin, the great Ray McLaughlin, two time Lion, forty cap, uh, Ireland international, former Ireland captain, part of the the famous Lions tour of seventy one that went and beat New Zealand. It's a uh, he leaves a fantastic legacy in Irish rugby and for the Lions as well. He certainly does, yeah. I, I got to know Raymond Lachlan over the years. He was involved in a number of uh, Irish squads. He was always the sort of scrum consultant. Every time uh, our scrum was in trouble with Ireland, Ray would get a phone call from Tommy Kiernan or Noel Murphy or someone, whichever comes down to Lansdowne Road on a Sunday morning. Uh, 
and he was technically absolutely brilliant. I mean, you talk about that Lions tour in, in 71. Uh, uh, ironically enough, um, both he, Sandy, Mar- Sandy Carmichael from Scotland, died last month. And, and Ray McLaughlin, the two of them, they would have been the test props going into the first test. Uh, there was a, a, one of the most uh, unbelievably bruising, physical, dirty provincial matches of all time when uh, they played Canterbury just two weeks out from the, the, the opening test. And both, I think, Ray McLaughlin broke his thumb, tried to sort out his opposite number, and Sandy Carmichael had his face smashed. So, um, but... Uh, Ray McLaughlin was kept on on the tour because of the fact that um, he was such an influential fellow off the field. He was almost like the forwards coach for the Lions as the Test Series came along. So um, from that perspective, look, he was a fantastic guy, very successful businessman. Uh, he was a great fellow to, uh, to just have a chat with and, and bounce things off. So look, he's a huge loss, a uh, lovely man. And I was very sorry to hear his, his passing yesterday, the other day. Yeah, apparently he went uh, he went spying on a on an All Blacks training session after he'd got injured uh, on that seventy one tour and came back with all the notes and their on their scrum and line out. If only if if only it was as easy as that these days, Bernard. Yeah, no, it's it's a lot more complicated, but yeah, great um, great legend of Irish rugby, and uh, yeah, it's um, obviously uh, he's someone to be well remembered and and um, taught to his friends and family. Yeah, and I'm sure he's going to be remembered this uh, this Friday night at the sports ground for Connacht are playing the Ospreys and Ryan with that game going to be on RT2 and the RT player as well. Fellas, that's it for this week. Thanks a million for joining us. Get yourselves ready for the, the URC returning this weekend. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. Yeah, looking forward to it. Cheers, but, guys. See you so next week. Bye-bye. Bernard Jackman and Don Lenehan there. Reminder, we've got Connacht against the Ospreys this Friday night on RT2. And then on Saturday, Leinster against Ulster. That's going to be at 8 o'clock also on RT2 as well. We'll speak to you next week. The RTE Rugby Podcast, sponsored by Canterbury. See the new Irish men and women's rugby jerseys at canterbury.com.